All right. Recorded. There we go. All right. Let's get kicked off. We've got, uh, I think people have got a fair number of people here. So um, first off, uh, folks, I just wanted to put out a big thanks to Christine, who's been taking the, the running the running the show on trust registries for us for some time now. But she's prepared this uh, this session for it, and she and I are going to prepare, provide that. Um, so we're going to cover off today, really trust registries, going a little bit beyond the basics, um, and you'll understand why. Big picture, we're starting up the efforts at Trust Over IP, one of the uh, uh, task forces that um, I co-lead along with Drummond Reed, um, because there's been a lot of interest in that. What's, what Christine's been working on is working with various different groups on, who are curious about where trust registries fit, where they're going, um, and she's going to open up the discussion uh, shortly here. Christine, you want to just dive in and take it yeah, away and I'll, I'll take over sure. at some point. Yeah, so uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so we're continuing the loop. We're here, uh, just we love to help solve complex issues. Um, you know, we're extremely passionate about these cutting edge technologies. And so we're just really excited to play a role in shaping the future of SSI ecosystems. You can go ahead, next one. So uh, the agenda is short, but we have a lot to cover. Uh, we're gonna go over just the basics of what is a trust registry, where we are now uh, with the trust registry protocol specification, what's next, and then some questions and answers as time allows. Next one. One quick thing, we will be uh, sharing out the recording as well as notes and yeah. anything we put into the chat and stuff like that for folks later. Mm -hmm. Uh, so basically, we've been talking about trust registries for a while now. Uh, we published the wallet report in 2019, and then we did a condensed version, chapter nine of the SSI book. You can see I read it a lot, have lots of notes in here. It's super helpful. It's, um, it, I mean, it looks intimidating, but it's not. It's actually really easy to read. Um, and I've also put together an updated and condensed version on our blog. We'll link to that uh, in the show notes as well. So next one. So really, trust registries are here uh, just to help us answer some of the hard questions that drive our trust decisions, uh, especially on a technical basis. Uh, questions like, is the issuer of this uh, credential authoritative? So if we're looking at a driver's license, um, was it issued in my case by the Ministry of Transportation of Ontario, or was it made by some you know, tech savvy teenager trying to pass for the age of majority? And then as a holder, if I'm presenting my driver's license or, you know, my travel pass at the airport, and that includes some of my most personal information, can I trust the verifier? As we go through this, you're going to see that there's so many more questions and answers that are needed. And uh, the work that we're starting over at the Trust Over IP Foundation is going to, you know, further investigate these questions. So if you're interested in joining, your participation is definitely encouraged and very welcomed. Next slide. So we're just gonna look at trust registries, uh, very basic right here for people not uh, deeply entrenched in the SSI or decentralized uh, identity space. Just talk a little bit about the trust triangle here. So the concept is that the issuer of a credential, they give something to the holder, that's me, the person, and then I'm gonna use it later with the verifier. So what happens when uh, the issuer and the holder, we have a whole bunch of, uh, cryptographic stuff going on in the background. Daryl called it crypto voodoo magic. I like crypto stuff a little better. Um, and so they know that uh, I've been issued the credential. I can use it later on. It's in my wallet and not somebody else's wallet. And so when I want to use that credential, let's say it's my travel pass. I want to enter a particular country. In that case, the airline, they're going to want to know that I've met the rules and regulations for changing countries. And that could include, you know, my vaccination status or all the various visas that you might require to enter a country. So I'm gonna to need to provide proof to the verifier. And what the verifier and I are gonna do on the cryptographic side of things, I'm not actually handing them a raw credential. I'm gonna be handing them cryptographic proof. So I still control that credential. It's in my wallet. I'm always the holder. The verifier, they're going to know that the issuer, um, they've signed off, they have, and that I haven't tampered with the data that's in that credential. And so this lets us know that the credential I've handed you is real, it's cryptographically proven to be solid, 
Um, but at that point, the verifier, they still just have to trust the issuer. In this case, um, what the way that we build that trust is with uh, decentralized identifiers, the DIDs. And so the issuer, they have a public DID and they've signed that credential that they've given to me. And the verifier, they can go into a registry network and verify that DID. The key here is that there is a public DID. It's referenceable by anyone. The verifier can confirm that. But there is a problem here. This triangle is just not enough. I mean, how does the verifier know that the issuer is authoritative? Like, you have to know that the person who issued that credential, are they legit? Was it a teenager? Because we know that there are people out there crafty enough to do these things. So that's actually, um, that question's a lot harder to answer. And so I'm gonna throw it over to Daryl, who's gonna really get into the governance side. Uh, thanks, Christine. And folks, just to, just to let you know, if I was in high school now, I would be the one issuing driver's license for 20 bucks a pop. So the <laughs> friends would get, uh, actually, I'd, I would probably go nationwide. So my friends and, uh, and family and, and strangers could get access to, you know, liquor, cannabis, whatever you need proof of age for. So we, we, Christine, thank you for that. Um, uh, folks, you can, you can see Christine has been been diving in pretty darn deep on this. Um, she's been helping out uh, in many different ways, contributing over at Trust IP on multiple things, and she can be she'll be with us at the uh, Trust Registry Task Force as well, which we'll talk about in a moment. So th this trust triangle has been around for a while. Um, we know it's not enough because that question, as Christine indicated, there's a couple questions there. How does the verifier know that it's really the the issuer that they are authoritative for that type of credential, and under under what auspices? But also, I may need to know, depending on what we're doing, I may need to know that, um, you know, should I release all of my driver's license information, all some deep health information to a verifier? Um, in many cases, we don't really need to know, you know, any verifier can check some stuff out. But let's talk about the decisions that need to happen. This is a, a concept that came out of, uh, out of Trust of IP. I think Charlie Walton, when he was at MasterCard, really came up with the term. And it's really a diamond, this triangle. Um, is missing a piece. It's missing the governance. And that's part of the reasons why we and we're one of the co-founders um, of, of Trust Over IP, that the governance and linkage to the technology is really where all the magic starts to happen. Um, that governance framework is the critical piece that brings, starts to answer the questions on a, uh, a wet code, a human basis of who are the issuers? What does one need to do to become an issuer? What are the rules of issuing? You know, do I have to prove uh, if you go, if you get your driver's license, you'll know the processes are quite heavy. You know, you have to provide a birth certificate. You have to provide a whole bunch of information, you know, a, a bill from a utility. They have a very rigorous process because once they issue the driver's license, it's now in use in flight. So that governance behind knowing what's happening is really, really critical. Part of the problem is, well, how do you do that soft, that wet code, human stuff, technically? That's where this trust registry uh, protocol, where trust registries really start to come into play. Um, because governance is how we manage those, um, the inevitable complexities. Uh, the minute you have one or two people, it's relatively easy. You go to three or four, things start to get hard. And the minute you start dealing with multiple organizations, multiple people organizations, things get really complex really fast. So we need to understand how do we handle those complexities when they pop and they pop quickly. Because governance is hard. And governance, though, when it's concretely implemented is really where the value is. If I look at a day to day example of a credit card, um, credit card, credit card networks and how they operate. Uh, fundamentally, there's a ton of technology behind it. So that the card will work at the at the counter. Um, Recently in Canada, we actually had our debit system and many payment systems fall down because a single telco went down. So there's a lot of tech behind it. But fundamentally, if you look at what our Visa, MasterCard, uh, Union Pay, Amex, they are governance networks. Their IP, their real magic is the governance that lets a person who presents a credit card know that, that they have access to credit. It lets the merchant know that they will be paid. Guarantee again against certain rules. Uh, the person, if I have a real problem with it, I can call Amex and say, "Listen, I bought something. It's not what they said it was. I want you to charge that back." And there are mechanisms that follow all of these very complex flows. But fundamentally speaking, it's a governance network. That bank issues a credit card. 
the card holder um, carries it around. The merchant knows what happens when they accept. And then we have the, the actual card network underneath this. But fundamentally, again, it's all about governance and the concrete implementation of those governance rules and regulations and processes. So we take a look at where are we with the trust registry specification. Version one has been bubbling around for about a year. Um, it's very basic. It really does, as Christine indicated, really three things. Um, it lets us know, is this um, issuer authoritative for issuing a particular credential type under a particular governance framework? So we could have a governance framework for driver's licenses. We could have a governance framework for lottery tickets. We could have a governance framework for sharing information about carbon credits or clean energy, clean, clean products. Um, then we would know that you are an authoritative issuer of a particular credential type because we can find you in the list. We can ask a question of the trust registry that says, tell me, do you recognize this issuer for this credential type under this framework? Yes or no. Similar thing if we need to, we can ask for, is this verifier authorized for this per particular presentation request? Um, you may want to take a look at it as an example. The, the driver's license gets overused, but because it's, we all use it. Um, at least two profiles of a driver's license could, could be in use. One is, I'm old enough to do something. That's really needs to know, you know, a picture of me. They don't need to know my name. They don't need to know my date of birth. They just need to know I'm over, in case of I'm in British Columbia, over 19. Quebec is 18. Much of the states is 21. You just need to ask, really ask that question and get a yes or a no. Law enforcement officer who pulls me over probably needs to see my full driver's license details, which likely includes information that I don't actually see when I read the when I read the actual card. It's uh, read it um, in my hand. There's a third question that we ask, and this is more a little subtler, but it is part of the. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, Christine, we, the, you, we we had a tweet storm a couple weekends ago, or maybe it was last weekend, um, that really got into you know why are we doing this work. Um, and in and, and some of the comments are, well, trust registry is just centralized trust. We're like, well, that's the nature of trust. Um, there will be many trust registries, but if you think that trust is utterly decentralized, I think you need to re-examine what trust looks like. Um, for different types of things, there are different trust registries. A list of uh, driver's license issuers for North America is likely different than a list of driver's license issuers for Europe but they probably know about each other. A list of driver's licenses uh, for North America is wildly different than someone who is tracking carbon credits in a particular province or state. They may not know about each other. They may not care about each other. The key there is there will be many. We, uh, one, of, uh, one of the clients that Christina has worked with, um, I've, I've advised a little bit, um, major, major financial institution asked the government, you know, how many trust registries and, and, and ecosystems do you think you're going to be part of? And they're expecting an answer of, you know, a handful. And when the government said hundreds, um, it, it, it caused a pattern shift in them to realize they're, they're and then you realize the math actually about government it might actually be thousands of trust registries of ecosystems that they participate in. They're in control of some, they have some strong influence in others and others they're just a member of. Um, so it really comes down to as you build this out and think about your day to day life, all those trust things that happen, there's wildly different levels of trust and you need to be able to talk to those other trust registries. So that's really what the trust registry task force created it fell out of the uh, good health pass work. Um, it's been really well received but we've been getting a lot of questions uh, at trust over IP. Uh, Christine has been fielding a ton of questions from various different folks ranging from financial institution corporations to governments. Um, both at, uh, at at both nation state level as well as subsidiary levels like provinces, states, cities. Um, the future, really, of what we're starting to kick off, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this 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 webinar is to kick this help kick this effort off. Is at trust over uh, trust over IP. We're starting the next version, whether that is a version one 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 point one or two point oh. I think it's two point oh myself because it gets a lot bigger faster. And the reason we got this sort of virtual iceberg is there was a lot more things we'll be discussing. I'm going to get into a bit of that right now. Um, some of them being schemas, what credential types, what does messaging look like? Um, we'll get into the what are we doing, but the key there is we're going to start exploring in more depth. We did capture a bunch in the version one because we wanted to get something out the door because there were no answers. 
you'll always find that that well this team here continuum loop but a lot of the people at trust rover ip um it, it's about getting things tested in the wild explored in the wild and used in earnest in production to make sure we do understand the bounds and the real what's what's necessary for production use cases which is why we start small you know are you an authoritative issuer are you an authorized verifier what other trust registries do you recognize i, I want to cover that tiny little bit as well the what other trust registries do you recognize is a really subtle but important thing if we go back to the work we did during good health pass what was qu quickly recognized global authorities wanted to put in an x509 um uh uh, type of credential network at full PKI heavyweight X509, which is a great technical solution. It's a great technical solution when you have a point of control. Um, passports is a good example, IKO, and there's a great point of control there on how passports work, how the crypto works there. You have a very limited numbers. It's, 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 it's actually legislated in every country and it's mandated and it's, it's passed by, you know, UN related um, institutions. You have control points. What was recognized quickly that health is an area where there are no control points. There's no single control point, at least. Every country has its own way of doing things. Every country has um, done things differently inside of itself. Um, in Canada, for example, certainly there is some federal activity, but largely speaking, um, health is the mandate of the provinces. It's similar in the states, but those two countries have different mechanisms by which they can enforce um, or influence or guide things, but they can't just drop the hammer and say, thou shalt do this. And there is certainly on a global level, no authority that can tell the countries what to do. There are some authorities like WHO who have a lot of influence in a lot of places. Um, arguably they have more influence in places where they are funding the healthcare systems. Um, but when they try to tell a country to do something, they realize very, very quickly, you can't do that. It doesn't work. So imagine the following trust registry question back to COVID and longer term. This is much more about the long term. COVID is, was obviously too fast, too tactical, but the work at Good Health Pass discovered the following. If I, as a country, um, will answer the following question. So imagine the US asks Canada, hey, do you recognize uh, this trust registry out of the UK? Yes or no, for health purposes, for this, for your health governance. And if the Canada responded, yes, that's a big signal. If they responded unknown, that's another signal. If they responded no, that's another signal that lets the US who's asking the question to make decisions. That's all it is. Canada's not saying you should use them, thou shalt use them. No, it's saying, listen, I trust them. Or I don't know who they are. Now we can start looking, hey, maybe this is the high school kid issuing driver's license because no one knows who this, who this, who this issuer is because it's in a different country. But you kind of get the idea. So maybe that Polish uh, driver's license that my son managed to find somewhere uh, really wasn't uh, from Poland. But back into the future, where we're going, all these many, many more things. We'll cover off a few of these and, and what's being worked on. It's being worked on in many, many places, um, ranging from wildly, uh, some groups have, have open sourced. Um, there's uh, uh, groups have built this into their product space. Trinsic has a, uh, a version one, uh, trust registry pro protocol uh, engaged um, in DCO is definitely working on things. You'll note, I don't know if Telegram Sam is on the call, but he and I were, uh, were, were having a great discussion on Twitter. We've also had discussions on Signal and stuff. We, he and I, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for Sam, at least. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm sure Sam, uh, I won't speak for him. <laughs> um, but we're going into the what's necessary and how do things that really operate, especially also how do we share this type of stuff? Well, let's cover off a few of these things. So where do we need work? So a lot of questions here that relate to DIDs, credentials, the wallets that are in flight, the proofs. And I'm going to go through each of these individually. But really, you start asking a whole bunch of questions. And, and then there are more questions underneath this. I'm not going to go into intimate detail there. That's really what the work that's being done at, uh, at Trust Registry is. Um, it's being done. Uh, Christine is helping some. Um, we've got a, um, I've been deployed on a, on a major client project um, that, that, that's kind of had me focus there. It's one of the many things that's in their, their plan, um, but it's in the plans of many different groups. So let's talk about the individual questions. So what about the trust registry itself? Right now, as I mentioned, really I can ask another trust registry about their thoughts on another trust registry. 
but I can't actually talk to a trust registry and say, hey, when were you last updated? What, uh, what regulations are you listed in? What, tell me the, 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 the data, the metadata about the trust registry itself. There's a lot of questions there. We need to figure out what does it mean to uh, codify um, regulation? You know, can I point at, for example, the uh, uh, governance authority for things like BC Gov, BC government, which I'm living in, I'm living in BC now. Um, they have the corporate registration, you know, where's there, someone asked a long time ago, I think I was actually, might have been me, you know, where's your governance framework for this? And, uh, and John Jordan was kind enough to say, uh, we don't need one, it's regulated, it's in legislation. British Columbia is the authority for issuing corporate registrations for the province of British Columbia. That's in law. Like perfect, but how do you ask that question technically? You know, how do I point at and say, show me your points of reference, and also ideally ones that those points of reference that point back to you, the trust registry. We talk about DIDs. Um, there's a lot of different questions here. Um, for example, which DID methods do you support? There are, uh, as folks may or may or may not know, um, the the W3C passed the the. Uh, did core specification. Um, it went through quite a rigorous uh, process. It was the only time there was actually a, that I'm aware of, I, I think it might actually be the only time that there was a formal rejection of the specification by some of the big players in Web2 um, who were saying things like, there are over 100 did methods. How can you standardize on this? It's like, well, how did you get uh, you know, to the point of all of the various different standards that became the web? You started with a lot. You had a power law that broke it down into okay, what's actually being used. Same things can happen with DIDs, but did methods start to raise up other questions? Not just, is it in wild, uh, wildly used in adoption or is it used in 0.00001% of the planet and not in your country? You may not want to do the work because every did method will require work. There are slight differences between how they actually respond to different things. Some are more simple, some are more, more advanced. But further, if you take a look at how some of the did methods were created, the raison d'etre might be, well, I'm a blockchain and I believe in tearing down governments. Well, it would be kind of hard for a government to adopt that blockchain. Uh, there might be policy and social issues in adopting that. Regardless, they may make the decision to adopt it, but likely based on popularity. Is it in use in the wild? Because you can't do everything. And frankly, some of the methods, ones are, are there for to prove a point, but are somewhat of a joke. I can't remember if it was snail or pigeon, whether it was snail mail or a pigeon, a passenger pigeon uh, uh, did method, um, which is, it was there to, to explain that this is possible to do really out of, out of band. Um, these dids are useful uh, offline, that kind of stuff. But also back to the dids, you know, where do I learn about it? What's, what's in your did docs? How do your did documents uh, refer back to your own governance framework? Do you uh, have other sources of truth. Can I go to DNS, DNSSEC to find some backups, some, some more anchoring information about your DIDs? What are the ways that I can find more ways to discover and feel better about your DIDs and what you're doing with them? Is there a requirement for your DIDs to be autonomous or um, are your DIDs controlled and anchored to a single uh, chain or something? meaning you aren't actually in control of your keys, the, 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 the wall that you created on the chain is in control, or do you have full control of the keys? Because that lets me decide certain things, um, at least understand your, your, your system. We talk about uh, the credentials and the requests, um, two wildly different things, but they relate to each other very, very closely. Um, for example, you know, what credential types are used in your ecosystem? W3C, has numerous ways of being W3C compliant. Um, JWT, there's various different JSON LD approaches. Um, and there's discussion still, and there's work on the version 2.0 on, on where do these land? The important part for the ecosystem, it's not a discussion of JSON, JSON LD, XML, CBOR, ASN1 encoding. The questions are what credential types are used in the ecosystem and tell me about them. Because if I'm a verifier, I may want to consume them. I may want to verify them. If I'm an issuer in a particular ecosystem, I need to, need to understand how am I encoding the data um, that I need to share? What is the format? What is the schema of those credential types that I'm authorized to use and how do I encode them? 
that's really important for the integration It's really important for the consumption, uh, the issuance, and for the holder. What can they expect to see? And is their wallet capable? We'll talk about wallets in a moment. Is their wallet capable of ingesting and of storing that credential? And then later flipping around to the other side, when I go to verify, what can I do? If you've issued me a driver's license that has no ability to, sh to uh, do selective disclosure, I'm taking your whole driver's license. Great. Um, am I allowed to do that? Is that a capability because there's a technical deficit or technical limit? Do I need to have a list of authorized verifiers because otherwise I'm going to have PII in the wild? Um, and we'll get into discussion on, on some of these things that uh, um, legal documents are not, in, in my view, in our view at Continuum Loop at least, um, a, a viable thing is, well, don't do that. It's illegal. That's already been proven. Privacy laws are everywhere and it doesn't matter. Um, you have to actually get caught. You have to be prosecuted and the prosecution has to actually find you enough to make it actually worthwhile to, to protect the information. So you start to want to look at, okay, what's necessary? Um, if I'm limited by the technology, I may say, you know what, driver's licenses? No, nope, we don't do those. Um, you need to issue an agent majority card. That's another ecosystem change that says, hey, agent majority card has a blurry photo and, uh, and a date of birth that can be used and or it simply says over 18. Um, this starts to answer these questions of, you know, what do these things look like on the request basis? Um, initially, they were called proof requests, the presentation requests. It also gets into the discussion of messaging. How am I asking for that? Not just the technicals of what does a proof request look like? What does a response to a proof request, a presentation request, the actual presentation of the data look like in a, in, a, in a data format? But how did I ask for that? Who started it? Did I offer the credential to you? Did you request it of me? Which way did we start? That's where you get into what messaging formats are being used. How are we testing that? How do we get to compliance? How do we get to that real deep standardization and real interoperability? Where I do understand the semantics of your domain. You may we operate in a completely different domain than I do. If an insurance company is looking for information, they are really deep and rich in their own financial institution market, specifically insurance. They know their ontologies, the dictionaries of how words are used, and now suddenly they're working in the mining environment to do some work and they're pulling in credentials. Those ontologies are wildly different. Words may be exactly the same with utterly different meanings. So I need to understand all of these things about you. It gets a little deep pretty quickly. As you can see, this is why we cut work off at those simple questions. Authorized uh, issuer, sorry, authoritative issuer, authorized verifier, and do you trust that other trust registry? Because this set of questions here is pretty big. And we'll be digging into that in the task force. Another question comes up, and this is being worked on by multiple projects. And while a while back, we were formally advising um, one of the provinces. We've been informally advising uh, some of the provinces in Canada for, for some time, actually uh, for many, many years now. Um, but one of the harder questions is, you know, uh, this gets into the part of the, uh, the book, the, the Walt Report. And I think we have a blog entry, Christine, if we put that in uh, the into the notes, at least the Bubba's, can I trust Bubba's wallet? Yeah. Um, it, it's a, it was a facetious question that really asked the following, um, you know, if I find in the app store uh, a wallet that is compatible, technically compatible, um, it's got 4.75 stars with thousands of reviews. Um, everybody loves using it, the best user experience. Um, but we find out it's built by North Korea. There's nothing in the world W3C specifications. There's nothing in the in the Hyperledger Aries and or whichever messaging approach you want to do for requesting. There's nothing in those that say, hey, when the information is in flight, that the North Koreans couldn't off gas the information to them, send a copy their way because they're building their proof request. They have access to the raw data. You need to know and answer the question, depending on what you're doing, which wallets do you support? Um, and it's not a question people like to hear, but reality is that there are going to be high assurance use cases where there's going to be a real limitation on which wallets are allowed to do what, because you're going to need to know that someone has tested that to make sure that it's not doing something nefarious. It's not doing something that is slightly off standard and not intentional, but could end up with dangerous results. So that's a really hard one. Um, there's work going on, great work going on at DIFF on some of the technicals behind that. 
Um, certainly the, the, the provinces in Canada that are active in SSI um, are diving in really hard on this one here. There's a lot more there. Um, we're just to tell you the 35 minutes into the meeting point, and we're largely done with our discussion here, unless we have some questions that are flying in. And please do ask, uh, ask questions. Um, work is starting up, and, and Christine and I will share out in both the, uh, the we'll, Christine will get a blog out, out with this, with some of the key uh, reference points that we've got, um, but uh, with pointers to the trust over IP groups where this is happening. So I chair the technology, technical stack working group. It's paired to the governance stack, but underneath that is the trust registry task force. That's where the actual uh, work gets done. Um, trust over IP is free to join. Uh, certainly trust over IP itself is a foundation. We were one of the original funders. Um, we're a very small shop. We're not uh, currently funding, but uh, we put a substantial amount of our cash into it. Um, it does actually you know, warrant and it is a really good place to, to throw, but you don't have to pay anything. You can join as an individual um, or you can join as a company, both free. Uh, you also though can step up to the steering member if you want. So I suggest if anybody wants to, to, to join us, please do. Um, and, and again, we'll get that link shared out uh, uh, through, through the various different channels that we're putting this recording on. Um, one of the questions that, that popped up uh, came in directly from, uh, from a, a, a uh, I won't name him, but I've already named him. <laughs> um, <laughs> is one of the topics with regards to trust registries, which is machine readable governance. It became part of a, a thread, and I think it was a new thread on, you know, um, where does machine readable governance sit? Um, what's really cool is, is I think the work that's been done on machine, machine readable governance uh, really applies to what we're talking about here. So a lot of those questions I've been asking, you know, that we're going to be exploring the trust registry task force, a lot of the thinking in machine readable governance helps answer those. Um, a lot of it comes down to if you if you followed, uh, oh, I got to name him now. Uh, if you follow Telegram Sam and I uh, on on Twitter and saw our discussion, it really comes down to not just semantics because that's a dangerous term. It comes down to what are you doing? What's your what's your business need? Um, and, and how are you operating? And depending on how you're doing, you may actually grab a dump of data from a particular trust registry that says, "Hey, here's all the information you need. Take it with you. Run off." The reality is that depending on where that is in my zone of control, we tend to look at three things. And when we look at, uh, from, from our perspective here, is there's an immediate zone where, you know, most of my day-to-day -day work is being done. And, and, and I have to, no matter what, even in times of crisis, focus here. For example, police would probably always want to have information on North American driver's licenses um, once, they're, once they're all digital. They may not want to have on board because they'll, they'll, you know, it's an exceptional thing, you know, things like, hey, fishing licenses because they're stepping in to take care of fishing licenses, but they may want to have a cache of that, who knows. But at some point, you're going to bump into something that you have never seen before, and you can't know all the answers, and you can't say, hey, give me a list of all your dids, because the first question they're going to say is, who are you? Mm -hmm. uh, because you may not be allowed to have that list. Um, you may be able to ask one at a time what those are, but it really just depends on what your needs are. We started out the, the trust over IP, uh, sorry, the trust registry task force spec, started out as a RESTful API. There are many other ways to deliver this, big dumps of data, um, on-chain protocols, uh, non-RESTful uh, approaches, our GRPC, whatever it is that we need, that's where the group will get to. Christine, do you see any, any questions at all? I already answered one question online. Yeah. I actually had a couple come in uh, yeah. before the webinar that were sent in to me. Okay. Um, so uh, the first one was trust registries will prove essential, um, but going one layer deeper, the next question is who will be trusted to create, maintain and validate entrance to the registry? A consortium, in some cases, a regulatory or governmental body, uh, the trust chain is difficult to seed. That was a, a comment that was sent in to me on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's that's a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, so, so it really comes down to 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 how formal are things. So here's a I'll give a, a a real crisp answer on one, but I'm going to change the answer. So for example, there is a, a I don't know if they're a trade association or what they are, but it's called AMVA. I don't even know what it stands for. AMVA is a lot of the vendors in the driver's license hard you know physical issuance cases. They're also getting involved with MDL. MDL is slightly you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't, you know, not fit 
in, in, in this world, it's got some its own, you know, own sort of walled garden issues, but largely speaking, it's a really good source of data for mobile driver's licenses. AMVA is the logical group to say, yeah, they're an authority. Um, I'm not sure if all of the states and provinces who participate would want to hand control over to say, yes, you are definitively the manager of the source of truth of is this issuer valid or not. The reason I say I'm not sure they're comfortable with that is there is a sovereignty issue here, not a self-sovereignty issue. It is a sovereignty of the nation state issue. It's hard for them to, and I don't know that they should, hand over control to someone else to maintain that list. They may be one source of truth. So the, the, the hard answer is ANVA is a logical place, but it may not be the place. And we may end up with very informal um, if people recall the beginnings of, of, of the internet and, uh, you know, when, when before pre Google days, there were the canonical list of lawyers, the canonical list of law societies and, or the canonical list of, of whatever, you're going to have that informal thing happen. But some point in time at some of those levels, you're going to have informal things like, Hey, this is the best curated list of folks that we follow. That'll probably always be informal. But someone's going to create something informally, like here's a list of all of the driver's license issues on the planet that may formalize or may say, hey, no, there's actually AMVAS North America. Here's the EU. But you know what? That informal source may be the de facto, de facto being the informal standard for source of truth. So it really, really ranges. And this is where the 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 incorrect assumption that trust registries centralize things they don't they give you a place to look to answer the questions you need to manage a particular ecosystem if that ecosystem is by nature utterly decentralized guess what we could have a DAO that does the votes that say christine you are allowed to do the issuance oh we voted you out christine you're no longer allowed to do the issuance totally decentralized if you will um, it falls into part of my, and I, I will try not to go on a rant, <laughs> that, that, that <laughs> the, the goal here is not to decentralize the world. That's a, that's a false premise, because no matter how you do it, one, I'll tell you this, there will be a point of centralization that you don't recognize. Two, um, Christine, if people do want to chat, just to drop, allow them to do that, or maybe you can't. Um, I don't well, I'm not, I don't... Yeah, I don't know if we can do that. Yeah, but uh, and, 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 and Jacques, uh, Jacques asked, you know, too bad we can't chat with participants. Yeah. Jacques has asked you to have a chat with our participants. Jock has been doing some really, really good work with DNSSEC, which, mm -hmm. depending on where you are, may be the perfect anchor point for a trust registry. If you are highly decentralized and uh, and 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 uh, one of your reasons for existing is you don't trust the man. Um, they may not be. If you're a nation state managing, for example, in Canada, uh, the gc.ca domain names, DNSSEC may be a perfect replace for you. It aligns with your overall uh, 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 key management approach. It aligns if it aligns with how you uh, put the people who are authorities and how you make the business decisions. Perfect. Lots of different answers here. And Jock, I think Jock, is, I'll, I'll speak for him. Um, they're doing a lot of work right now at CIRA. Um, can you look that up, please? It's bad on me. Can can Canadian Internet Registrar oh. Authority Agency? Um, but they're basically they 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 they. And this is a great example of trust registries, in, informal to formal. Years and years and years ago, the .ca domains. I remember trying to get one. It was hard. Um, .ca domains back in the day were managed for years on a spreadsheet. That was a trust registry for DNS. Um, obviously formalized. Sierra's actually gotten to the point where they have actually built tooling and they use that, other countries use that tooling. Other top level domains use that tooling because they understand the rigor required to manage the DNS trust registry. So that's another good example of where things can be. So I think I diverged a little bit there. Thank you, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> Canadian Internet <laughs> Registration Authority. Yeah. I did sort of mumble through it, I think. Um, um, so Carly uh, has a question that she uh, sent in. Um, 
It's a good question. Do you see a model like a stock market for trust registries? One can buy stocks privately, but to trust that you were getting the yep. correct information and buying legitimate stocks, you would need a, a Legitimate stocks, you would go to one of several stock markets with their own governance details while also under regulation. There could exist markets of registries that are overseen by regulation, and you could still have private registries. Yep, I absolutely, Carly, down the road. And this was, uh, again, I, uh, we, we worked with a client who, who, who asked the government, uh, how many ecosystems and trustries do you think you'll need to be in contact with? And again, they were expecting handfuls. When they heard the answer hundreds, like their jaw literally dropped, all of them on the call were like, like it, it just, they recognized they cannot be in control. They cannot be in control of this. It gets too big too fast. And you end up, what I would say, you kind of fall into this, your own gravity well, if you try to interact with all of these, because that 101st one is still gonna take effort for you to integrate with because you got to find them. You didn't know they existed. You found out about them. You got to find the endpoint. Okay, cool. Anybody else know about these folks? It's very logical for a third party, God forbid, in this central decentralized world where their job is to provide kind of an aggregator function. It's all this aggregate, disaggregate. Uh, 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 this is the nature of the internet. It, 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 it combines, it blows apart. It recombines in different ways. Um, the question would be further on that is, is there liability when I am paying someone and what happens when they let that high school student in for the province of New Brunswick, for example, and New Brunswick wasn't actually issuing driver's licenses digitally. Mm -hmm. What happens when they're wrong? So we'll get into the same sort of indemnity thing, which we already have structures in many, many places for. But also, as you look at this de decentralized way, there might be a penalty that says, no, you were wrong and we just voted you down on this. There's a penalty to pay. You've staked something, you get a slash of 1%. If you screwed up this way, you get a slash of 20% if you screw up that way. So definitely I see that happening because when you get to the world where you're literally talking to thousands of trust registries, thousands of ecosystems from time to time, you need to go somewhere. That's a really great, really great question. Yeah, I'm good. Um, so I have one more that was sent in to me. Um, they would just like to know how do trust registries verify that you're the owner of a credential? Um, so this might be related to there's, there's multiple ways to prove. One of the questions that trust registry answers is, are you a bona fide, are you an authorit authoritative issuer of this credential type? There are other ways in the SSI book. There, I think there's four ways. I can't remember them all. Um, you may have a credential that says I am a, a, a um, an issuer. For example, I am a professional, licensed professional engineer in the province of Ontario. I have literally a stamp <laughs> that I has my number on, and I would have to sign it. There's no digital thing for this, but one could imagine me receiving a professional engineer credential that I could use later to sign something. Um, I would hope it would actually use a did because dids are better at signing than a credential, but it would have my did in the credential that says this is Daryl's public did, publicly recognized did in a credential that you can say, are you really a professional engineer? Yes, here's my credential. At some point though, you, you'll always walk the chain back that says, and who said that that, that, that professional engineers Ontario is allowed to issue those credentials to Daryl. You always end up back at a list of dids. No matter how you look at it, it depends on how many steps you go, you always end up with the, are you recognized as an authority? And in Canada, licensing professional engineers has been uh, handed down to the provinces and territories. I believe that's actually correct. I'm not sure about the territories. There might be some funky there. And there's legislation of which you might say, hey, yeah, these are the 10 or 13 dids that are professional engineer issuers that you're still that's at a trust registry so would a trust registry be able to recognize a credential coming in to say yep here's the list we can certainly could you could certainly do that but at that point it really is the trust registry um i'll just jump back to uh it is the trust registry acting 
as a verifier in that state to update their own files so that the ex outside world sees, yes, that issuer is, is considered bona fide because there was a work pro, there was some business process happening behind the scenes where they actually follow through the same type of thing. Hopefully that, that helps answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was uh, it for well, the ones that I had sent in. Perfect. Unless anybody else has any questions. Let's give folks a, a minute for any, any last questions. We're already at 10 minutes. We can give folks back to their day. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, well, what can you do? I think I duplicated slides here. A um, couple things you can do. One is join that and we'll, we'll get the link out to the to the task force, the trust receipt task force. If you need to join trust over IP, we'll make sure there's uh, information on who to contact for that. But also for your projects where you're considering this, this is one of the reasons why we, we help different groups and Christine's been, been key on this. Um, understand what this means because things are changing. Um, you're seeing projects, dozens of projects at government level now um, where they're realizing that in order for their nation state sovereignty, they need to be in control. And they're stepping into this space and these structures are becoming more and more important. So um, understanding you know, what it means to you is really important. But if you want to start working on this, there's really a few different ways to do it. One is start diving into the actual technical discussions. The technical discussions are very, very deep down in the weeds. If you're looking for governance and business, you may have to you know, reach out and reach out to some other leaders in the space, um, but also openly discuss this stuff. Get on Twitter, get into some of the discussion groups and, 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 and various different fora so you can one, learn about it, two, share what you believe is true. Now, Jacques, who we were talking about earlier, has uh, done some really great presentations to um, I think he's done to both IETF and may have actually done it to ICANN um, on where DNSSEC can play a role in, in this overall trust registry space, but get public. Um, and then lastly, um, where did I, is it the end of the deck? Uh, yeah, that is. Perfect. Um, so just, I wanted to say, I wanted to push on, one of the things I've got a rule is, uh, sorry, I wanted to pass on a thank you to Christine um, to for one stepping in here, um, as you can tell, Christine has been taking carrying a lot of the weight of what Continuum Loop does in this space. Um, has been helpful. Has also even done the grunt work of uh, diving in and helping with just overall work at Trust Over IP. That uh, because I've been deployed with clients on a client project, I've not been able to. But Christine, big thanks to you for stepping up and doing that. I see Thank some you. questions. Uh, okay, oh, Jacques um, did. Uh, yeah, Jacques did. Wow. He presented to ICANN at 3 a.m. So technically, that mm -hmm. was today. <laughs> nice work, Jacques. Uh, so Jacques has presented uh, some DNSSEC, really cool ideas there um, uh, to both IETF um, and to ICANN because DNSSEC is a really good anchor point. Uh, Marcus, uh, Marcus Ubani has uh, pointed out, share that link out to Christine from the chat. Yeah. I just uh, copied it and I've saved it in my notes. So I'm yeah. going to have a look at that for sure. I'm going to share that in the chat here as yeah. well. Okay. Just, uh, just that was. Uh, Can everyone uh, see the chat? They will be able to see the chat. They won't see the. Oh, okay. Chat. Okay. Uh, I'm just putting Marcus's comment here about uh, another resource. I was not aware of that. Good. That's awesome. Um, Thank you. There's another resource out there for a Git book that's out there. Um, Perfect. And that's part of the key here is is there's a lot of leaders in this space and a lot of people are playing different roles and someone who's sort of consolidating and sharing information. I'm a huge fan, just as folks, you know, as you explore this, you know, do your work. Um, when you recognize there is a lot of work here, you need to make a decision if it's yours or not your work to do. There are other people in this space who can probably help you. And that's, you know, some of these things. Yeah, Jacques, the chat is disabled and we're winding up. I'm not sure something you wanted me to share. I'm not sure how we even, uh, turn on chat. Uh, we'll have to, I'm going to make sure we figure that out for yeah. next time. Really sorry about I think it's that. It's probably very similar to, to Christine not having video in the beginning that um, <laughs> someone, yours truly, when he set up the webinar link, didn't click the right buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Jock is going back to bed due to after his 3 a.m. I'm sure after doing a presentation, um, it wasn't easy to fall asleep. So I'm sure, Jock, you're quite yeah. tired. Thank you for joining oh, yeah. us, uh, us here. <laughs> Thanks to everyone. Thanks a lot. Yeah.
I think that's it for questions. So thank you very much, folks. Again, thank you, Christine, for stepping up and stepping in here. Thanks. It's been uh, it's been awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have an awesome Bye. day. Bye. Bye.